Hi and welcome back to program analysis. This is video number four in this lecture on symbolic and concolic execution. And what I want to do in this short fourth video is to talk about one large scale application of this idea of symbolic and concolic testing in practice. There are many, many other applications of these ideas in practice. So this is just one um, example. But I think it's, it's pretty uh, nice to show that these ideas do not just work on these tiny examples that we use here in the lecture, but actually also can be used to find uh, bugs in popular and very large programs. So this example of a large scale use of concolic testing is based on a tool called Sage. So Sage is an implementation of concolic testing, basically as we've seen it here in the lecture and was developed a couple of years ago at Microsoft Research. So what Sage is used for um, is to test the robustness of um, a large set of programs against unexpected inputs that are read from files. So you can, for example, think of um, a media player or maybe um, an, an, an office uh, like application that is opening files, maybe files it does not trust, and where you want to check whether anything unexpected in these files could, for example, lead the program to a crash or maybe trigger some behavior that um, attackers could exploit by um, sending some malicious file to someone who then opens maybe a Word file and then um, um, lets the attacker um, um, yeah, exploit a vulnerability in the, in the underlying code. So in order to um, test for these behaviors, what Sage is doing is to start with a few known input files. So for example, it takes known audio files, which are just regular audio files, or maybe known office documents that are, um, that, that are known to be good documents, and then handles each byte in these input files as a symbolic input, which means that it's basically trying to change every byte um, or at least it's trying to change some bytes in these input files in order to trigger different paths that have not yet been taken while executing the tested programs. And in order to find out which bytes to modify and how to modify them so that you will then um, reach some new behavior that you haven't seen before, it's using this idea of concolic execution. So it's um, executing these programs, for example, MS Office programs, um, gathers path constraints while doing this, and based on the path constraints, then um, asks the solver, which will tell um, Sage how to change the bytes in, this input, in these input files in order to trigger some paths that have not been taken before. So this Sage tool has been applied to many, many different applications that are relevant for Microsoft. Um, so it has been applied to hundreds of applications. And in um, this period of um, five years between 2007 and 2012, actually more than 400 machine years of computation have been um, used to uh, run this concolic uh, testing. So it's, it's actually pretty expensive to run it, but at the same time, it also um, has been worthwhile, which is why um, yeah, a company like Microsoft has decided to invest um, that much computational power into it because um, this Sage tool has found hundreds of bugs in these programs, including many security vulnerabilities. Just to give you a feeling for how this compares to maybe some other techniques that are used to find this kind of bug, um, one third of all the bugs that have been discovered by any kind of file fuzzing during the development of uh, Microsoft Windows 7 have been found using this Sage tool. So it actually has had um, a significant input. If you're interested in more details, there's a nice paper um, that has appeared at ICSI a couple of years ago that describes this whole experience of running concolic execution um, on a large set of, of uh, yeah, real-world applications and how the different bugs um, have been discovered by doing that. So let me finally summarize this lecture on uh, symbolic and concolic execution. So we've seen that these two techniques are um, both solver supported forms of white box testing, where white box means that um, the test generation is um, supported by an, a relatively expensive program analysis that looks inside the program and tries to find out what happens if particular inputs are used and how we can learn from these um, inputs and the behaviors they trigger to generate new inputs that then trigger new behavior. This is done by symbolically reasoning about some of the inputs or maybe all of the inputs and by creating new inputs that will cover not yet explored paths.
In contrast to the techniques that we've seen in the previous lecture where we looked into random testing and fuzzing, um, these techniques are more systematic because they actually look into the program and they know exactly, okay, there's this path that I have not yet covered, so let's do this little change of the input in order to now cover this path that I haven't covered before. Whereas with random and fast testing, it was a much less systematic um, way of generating new inputs um, by basically hoping that you would find um, um, or that you would trigger some new behavior. Um, there's a trade-off between being systematic and being more um, probabilistic because the systematic approaches like this um, example of symbolic and concordic testing that we've seen here also typically are more expensive. So there's no free lunch and uh, in practice each of them can work well um, depending on what kind of program you're analyzing and what kind of um, behavior you try to you try to actually trigger. Um, there are also a couple of interesting open research challenges around this whole idea of symbolic and concordic testing. Um, for example, um, it's still a, a not completely solved challenge how to effectively and efficiently explore a huge sp search space um, that, is, that is given by this execution tree. So we've seen that these execution trees can be infinitely large, and even if they aren't, they can be very, very large. And um, picking the right branches to explore further is still an ongoing um, challenge that people are looking into. And then, of course, there are many, many other interesting applications of this constraint-based reasoning about, about programs. So, for example, in the space of debugging or automated program repair, where people are using these ideas of symbolic and concordic testing to, for example, find out why a program is buggy or maybe even how to fix it so that um, the bug um, goes away. And this is already the end of this lecture on symbolic and concordic testing. I hope you now have a better idea of how this uh, relatively systematic way of automated test generation works and also how it maybe compares to what we've seen in the previous lecture where we talked about random and fast testing. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.